Welcome to Daybreak Australia. I'm Heidi Stroud. What's in Sydney? We're counting down to Asia's major market opens. I'm Annabelle Drawlers in Hong Kong. The top stories this hour. People of the region are confronting a real danger of a devastating full-scale conflict. Now is the time to defuse and de-escalate. The UN chief telling an emergency Security Council meeting it's time to step back from the brink following Iran's drone and missile attack on Israel. The US and Israel weighing their next steps after allies helped mostly foil the first strike on the Jewish state from Iranian soil. And Tehran saying the attack marks a new equation, signalling a much bigger response to any further Israeli strikes. Let's have a look at how markets are reacting so far. This is the very early moments for, for Brent crude, WTI, gold. All of these starting to come online. The dollar index, of course, uh, trading in a much larger range. But what we are seeing so far is actually at Brent crude really not rising that much at all. It's, it's moving pretty much flat at this point in time. You're still sitting above that $90 a barrel level. You're above 85 as well on WTI. Uh, but certainly there is that question if we see the conflict widening even further could we be looking at something that's more like $100 a barrel uh, and expecting a further flight into some of those more safe havens? You do see the dollar, gold, a little bit bid there. Uh, what could be keeping prices perhaps from escalating a little bit further? Well, there's two reasons here. You've got firstly the Iran, the US. They were able to intercept a vast majority of drones and missiles. And then adding to that as well, you've got the Biden administration commenting that they're not going to be supporting any sort of Israel counterattack that could be something that's calming investors' nerves a little bit for the time being. But let's also take a look at U.S. futures. I see how these are coming online for equities and also for treasuries. Again, really just monitoring whether we are seeing any sort of flight to safety here. It's fairly flat so far, but as we said, Heidi, these are the early moments. There's a lot we still don't know about this and also what the next steps could be. Yep, the market's bracing for more uncertainty to come as we continue to uh, get really the details across to us. The UN Security Council has just met to discuss Iran's attack on Israel. Secretary General Antonio Guterres says it is vital to avoid any action that could lead to major confrontation on multiple fronts. Bloomberg Balance of Power anchor Joe Matthew joins us now from Washington. And Joe, there is a scramble, a diplomatic scramble, to avert a broader regional conflict. And in fact, this you know huge salvo of, of drones and of missiles really... Uh, exactly the kind of uh, uh, potential result that uh, global powers have long feared when it comes to this region. That's exactly right. We all grew up uh, thinking this was the impossible, something that we would actually never see with Iran uh, conducting a strike directly against Israel. But there's a sense of, uh, I, I guess, relief at the White House, even victory. They're calling this an extraordinary success, the fact that they blocked 99 percent of these rockets and missiles, the fact that we're not talking about casualties this morning, it's truly remarkable. The president not only convening, as he says, our uh, G7 allies, but he took time today to call the pilots from the two fighter squadrons that fly F-15 fighter jets that helped to knock down those missiles overnight. They are trying very hard to frame this as a success, while at the same time, Putting an end to this, their real concern right now is that Israel is, of course, going to conduct uh, a large st uh, strike of some st sort in retaliation. The United States is doing everything it can now, along with its allies, to keep that from happening. Yeah, the lack of damage, though, and casualties in that, do you think that that also indicates perhaps Israel actually could limit any sort of counter-strike? It's a great question. I don't think anyone has an answer to that right now. What it does tell us, though, is that this attack by Iran was very carefully choreographed and it was very carefully telegraphed. Not only did Israel have hours notice on the launch of these drones, uh, as you know, we were talking about this four and five hours ahead of time, but they had a good week's notice from Iran in a general sense, knowing that a retaliation was in the offing. This was said to be in concept, an eye for an eye, but of course, Iran did more than that. And this is significant to think that if some of these missiles and rockets did get through, we could be talking about hundreds of Israeli deaths today. And, and the fact that we are not brings us to a different point in this conversation. The White House is hoping that this might be the end of it.
It's an interesting dichotomy, isn't it? Such fine calibration of this attack. And as you say, we had been bracing for this for over a week and at the same time closer than ever to a broader regional conflict. And I do wonder, the way that things stand now, with no further developments, does it allow both sides perhaps to claim a degree of victory here? They might, although it does seem that Israel is determined to do something at this point. And as far as what happens at home, there is a very important political ramification here as the House of Representatives potentially prepares a vote on funding for Israel. It may be tied with funding for Ukraine. Both of these are very controversial with their respective uh, uh, sides of the aisle here. Progressive Democrats are very concerned about sending more money and materiel weapons to Israel, while many conservative Republicans do not favor, at least those aligned with Donald Trump, sending money to Ukraine. So if these are in fact bound together here and see a vote next week, it is absolutely unclear if there is a path for it to succeed. A Bloomberg Balance of Power anchor Joe Matthew there with the latest. Let's get some more insights now from Amin Saikal, who is the adjunct senior fellow at the S. Rajanatham School of International Studies joining us. Amin, really great to have you with us. I suppose I'll start off with the question that everyone is asking. Do you expect a retaliation from Israel? And if so, what does that look like, given we've just spoken about the fine calibration and choreography of what we saw from Iranian soil? Well, there's no question that the Iranian uh, response uh, was to Israeli uh, bombing of the Iranian consulate in uh, Damascus uh, last week or the week before. And uh, therefore, I think uh, it was a measured response on the part of the Iranians. Uh, they, didn't want, they, they, they really didn't want to get into a war with Israel. Uh, but uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has been vowing for a long time uh, to do whatever uh, Israel can do in order to prevent Iran from uh, producing nuclear weapons. And he has uh, he had uh, vehemently opposed uh, the July 2015 Iran nuclear agreement, and he had called on the Biden administration uh, since uh, the start of that administration not to negotiate with Iran. And uh, he had also vowed that uh, uh, if necessary, Israel will act on its own in order to prevent Iran from acquiring uh, nuclear weapons. So, uh, uh, no, uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu does have a pretext uh, in order to attack I I Iran. So, uh, a retaliation on the part of Israel is not out of the question at this point. What are the chances to you of this spiraling into a broader regional conflict that so many fear? Well, I think it can easily spiral into a, a much larger conflict simply uh, because uh, that uh, uh, Iran and uh, or the Islamic Republic of Iran and Israel have been arch enemies for a long time. And of course, uh, the United States has always been on the side of Israel and has been committed to, to the security of the state of Israel. So if the, uh, uh, even uh, prime uh, President Biden may not be in favor of war in the Middle East, and of course he has said this in the past, uh, uh, but if uh, uh, Israel uh, does carry uh, a, a retaliatory attack, then Iranians will uh, respond, and the United States uh, will be dragged into, uh, 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 into the war in support of Israel. And Iran will definitely receive a lot of support from Russia and also possibly from China. And as a result of that, I think uh, that the situation could really spiral out of control. And uh, the, we, we may really face, as uh, the UN Secretary General has said, a devastating uh, conflict which could take a really global dimension and therefore affect not only the region, but uh, uh, its uh, consequences uh, affecting uh, the, you know, the globe as a whole. Can you give us a sense of, of the, the significance of the weekend strike in terms of reaching that sort of point? If you compare to where we were, say, on, on Friday or, or last week, before these strikes really started to gain international attention or the risk of them, how much closer are we at this point in time? Well, we are very close. If uh, the Israeli leadership decides to retaliate, and then the Iranians have made it absolutely clear uh, that they will respond to that, and their response will be harsher. Um, but at the uh, at the same time. Uh, 
I, I think both sides have also reached a point uh, to restore uh, deterrence uh, between them, uh, in the sense that the uh, Israelis have claimed that they've shot down 99 percent of those uh, Iranian missiles and drones and so on, uh, although uh, it must be really uh, said that uh, it was not just Israel shooting down all those uh, uh, drones and missiles, uh, it was really with extensive help of uh, uh, the United States, uh, Britain, and of course, uh, France. And Jordan also played an important role. Uh, and, and as uh, your reporter said, it was choreographed and uh, uh, related to, to the Israelis uh, over uh, a week. And uh, they, uh, therefore, Israelis and their allies had been really prepared for this. But if it was an attack which had not been uh, announced before and the Israelis didn't know anything about it, then I think the casualties would have been higher and indeed also the impact impact would have been higher. And that also very much indicates that Iran really does not want uh, to get into a war with the, uh, Israel uh, and, of course, the United States also playing an important role. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it seems that we are on a brink. And as the Sec UN Secretary General has said, I think it's important that all sides uh, pull back and uh, to try to avoid a devastating uh, war, which could really uh, lay the foundations for a, a World War III, and of course, uh, Vladimir Putin has said this uh, a number of times, and uh, th therefore, uh, Russia would, would definitely uh, come uh, to the aid of the Iranians, as Iran has uh, provided assistance to Russia in its operations in Ukraine. In the event that we do see any sort of Israeli retaliation, what would be the, the targets of that as well, do you think? Well, definitely, I think uh, Israelis would target uh, Iranian uh, uh, nuclear sites and also major military bases. And uh, uh, But the other target would be, of course, uh, the Iranian oil resources. And uh, that could have a really global impact uh, on, the, or, or on the economy uh, across the world. And uh, uh, therefore, I think this is the sort of thing which uh, has to be really uh, avoided. Um, uh, uh, I mean, I Iran also has an important nuclear program. Uh, we know uh, for a fact that uh, Iranian uh, uranium enrichment has reached uh, something like 60 uh, percent, and it may have been really higher. Uh, to, uh, of course, I I Iran sooner or later would be in a position uh, to produce nuclear weapons. And of course, this is what is the major concern of Israel, as well as, uh, as some of its allies, the United States in particular. Uh, Israel wants to be the only nuclear power in the region, and therefore have uh, this age of supremacy in the region, and that's one of the other, uh, other reasons that Israel will be very keen to, uh, to uh, find the opportunity uh, to act against the Iranian uh, nuclear uh, installations and facilities. Uh, but of course, uh, that could also result in a major war whether it, that, that nobody may, uh, at the end may be able to control it either militarily or diplomatically. Prior to this, of course, the U.S. did ask China to ask Tehran not to retaliate. They also asked the same with the likes of Turkey and Saudi Arabia. I do wonder when it comes to the dimension of China's involvement, potentially Russia as well. Beijing's calling for restraint. But at what point would you see further involvement from these parties? Well, China has uh, a 25-year strategic agreement uh, with Iran, uh, which was signed in uh, 2021, uh, I believe. And uh, uh, the, certainly uh, China is heavily involved in the infrastructural uh, development of Iran, industrial development of the country, as well as uh, there is very strong intelligence and military cooperation between the two sides. Uh, uh, of course, the Chinese uh, wouldn't want to really war, uh, get into a war, uh, but the at the same time, if there, uh, if there is a uh, the wider conflict between uh, Israel and uh, Iran, uh, then uh, China will be on the side of the uh, Iranians. Uh, whether China will uh, uh, you know, get militarily involved, I think that uh, remains to be seen. Uh, but at the same time, it will provide an opportunity uh, for uh, China to establish its position as a world power and uh, therefore vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the United States and its allies. 
How much bandwidth do you think there is for President Biden, for the US, to continue to support Israel, as they will continue to do, but of course there does seem to be broader limitations on what that looks like, given President Biden is already struggling to maintain popular support when it comes to the conflict in, Israel, in, in Gaza? I think there's a limit to the amount of support that the United States can provide to Israel. Uh, of course, uh, the Biden administration is very much concerned that it is an election year, and therefore uh, he must do whatever really possible in order to win the election. Uh, but at the same time, he's uh, uh, opposed uh, by Donald Trump, uh, who has uh, declared his 100% uh, uh, support for uh, Israel. Uh, it, uh, uh, President Biden doesn't want to be upstaged by uh, 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 Donald Trump uh, 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 at this point. Uh, but uh, uh, let's not forget that, uh, uh, you know, the United States cannot be uh, a source of unlimited supply of financial, economic, and uh, military aid to, to Israel. Uh, because uh, it, 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 it's not just that Israel has become isolated internationally as a result of the colleges that is really created in Gaza, but also the United States has been widely um, uh, uh, implicated in the Israeli actions. And this is not a reputation that the United States would like to really have internationally. And therefore, the Biden administration will have to be very, very careful to weigh all the uh, uh, options before it can continue to provide the same degree of support to Israel that has done so far. I mean, of course, President Biden has stated that, you know, uh, America's uh, commitment to, to security of Israel is ironclad. But uh, at, the, at the same time, at the same time, uh, he's uh, uh, really trying to uh, uh, pressure uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu not to retaliate and therefore ignite a uh, Middle East war in which the United States would have to, uh, to get involved uh, as part, as a strategic partner of Israel, and therefore uh, that will uh, uh, really, uh, you know, make the war to, to, uh, to take a global dimension. That was Amin Sakal there, adjunct senior fellow at S. Rajanatham School of International Studies. Thanks very much for your time this morning. And as we said, we're keeping a very close watch on any sort of response that we're getting to this weekend event. And uh, the latest on this is what we're hearing from the U.S. It's just issued a readout of uh, the call between... Secretary of State Blinken and then also Jordanian foreign ministers, or foreign minister rather, Blinken. But essentially what we're hearing here is that the U.S. is saying it doesn't seek any sort of escalation and also that the U.S. says it's going to be continuing to support Israel's defence. So that is the, the readout from that call, as we said, between the foreign ministers of the U.S. and also uh, Jordan. But the market reaction so far, it's pretty muted, you have to say, really, uh, gold just fractionally high here. Earlier we did see spot gold, gold spiking as much as 1.2%. But generally that flight to havens like the Japanese yen, like the dollar, it's fairly range bound as we get in so far. So telling us perhaps investors are still seeing the risk of further escalation contained for now. But you can uh, certainly turn to your Bloomberg for more insights on this. You can go to T Live Go to get commentary and analysis from Bloomberg's expert editors. We'll, ha we'll have plenty more to come on Daybreak Australia. This is Bloomberg. been watching the market reaction so far to the weekend attack, uh, the Iran strike that was launched against Israel. And, and so far what we're seeing in markets is really just fairly muted. Uh, given we've got little flight to, to haven so much, we've actually seen US futures pointing a little bit higher. Uh, the yen a little changed, gold a, a little bit bid, but, but again, futures there looking fairly steady at this point in time. Uh, so markets, they really do seem to be taking this into their stride so far. But let's uh, discuss this with our senior markets editor and Bloomberg opinion columnist, John authors. And John, uh, what we're seeing in the markets right now, is that sort of any surprise to you at all? Um, compared to what I would have expected on Friday night, no, not really. Basically, this, I'm not trying to downplay the significance of what happened. 
don't fire 300 missiles at another country unless something pretty serious is going on. Um, but it had been very well trailed. They had more or less, the Iranians had more or less told the Americans and various neighbors what they were going to do. Um, and that was widely known in the markets on Friday. As, as we went home on Friday, we knew there was a, that, that we were wondering when the attack was going to happen, not if it was going to happen, but when. Um, given the way the attack has actually unfolded with um, what appears to be an extremely successful um, bid to defend Israel, barely anything hit its target. They didn't even seem to aim at uh, major civilian targets, as Iran is saying, as far as we're concerned, we're good. This is we're, we're, we're done. Um, this does, compared to what it was reasonable to be worried about, on Friday, this is about us uh, reassuring, if you can call a missile attack on a foreign country reassuring. This was about as reassuring a way for the scenario to unfold over the over the weekend as you could realistically have hoped for. So it doesn't surprise me. Um, you know, oil is fairly flat. Um, in the case of bonds, you have this problem that there is a safe haven bid might take yield down, but fears that it, it, oil is going to go through the roof and force central banks to hike rates again would, would take yields up. Um, so again, they are rather frozen uh, as investors try to work out what is the what they are more scared of, what the greater risk is. John, would you expect investor sentiment to kind of lose that nonchalance that we're seeing, if you will, if there are further developments here? Um, yes. Uh, I, I wouldn't describe it as nonchalance, although certainly if you're talking U.S. stocks or crypto, um, yes, there's been outright exuberance for a while. Um, you do see... The VIX, the various measures of volatility, have ticked up a little. Credit spreads, which have been remarkably low, have ticked up a little. In both cases, they have a lot further they could go. Um, if you do actually get a meaningful Israeli response, even though it's fairly clear the Americans are doing everything they can to persuade the uh, Israelis not to do that, um, Yes, I think that would then get very scary indeed because some of the, the uh, scenarios your previous guest was discussing would begin to become more relevant, whether Russia would help Iran, whether, uh, whether you would get a more, a more generalized conflict that went beyond the Middle East. Um, I would agree that on balance that's unlikely. If it happens, and it, I, guess, I guess such a scenario is more likely than it was, say, a week ago, then, yes, that's that's bad. Uh, the risk of being trite, that is really, really yeah. bad. You would expect oil to go through the roof and you would expect anything that was prone, you know, disliked risk to be very seriously damaged by that. Mm. John Arthurs, our senior markets editor and Bloomberg opinion columnist there. We do have more to come here on Daybreak Australia. This is Bloomberg. We're taking a look at a live shot there of Tel Aviv, that skyline, but also how oil prices or oil markets are faring so far at the start of trade. So Brent crude and WTI both little change at this point in time, still holding above those those levels, $90, $85 a barrel, but uh, tracking it very much because we saw more than 300 missiles and drones fired by Iran at the weekend. It is the first time it has struck Israel from its soil, though many, of course, intercepted with the help of Israel's allies, including the U.S. Uh, for more, let's get uh, to our next guest, Tom Closer. He's Global Head of Energy Analysis at Oil Price Information Services. And I'm interested for your views this morning, Tom. We're not really seeing much of a reaction. Is that what you would have anticipated as well? Well, I, I think there's a big sigh of relief. Uh, in, in the world and certainly in the U.S. and probably Israel and perhaps even Iran. 
that, you know, there was a measured response and there was really no horrible damage. So it may be, in fact, that on Friday we saw the highest prices we may see for crude oil until the second half of the year and the highest prices for U.S. gasoline futures and until the second half of the year. I'm a little worried about what happens in August, but I think this was a real, real uh, kind of a case where it didn't live up to the to the billing and to the worries. Yeah, because there's a lot of talk about how, just how choreographed this was so that, so that Israel and its allies could respond. But there is still uh, perhaps some question marks. What does this mean for, for the shipping, for instance, in the area as well? So is that something you're tracking instead? Well, I think that's an old story, though, the fact that shipping is uh, leading to a lot more oil on the water and, you know, some benefits for the people that don't have to worry about that. You know, Annabelle, uh, crude oil prices are extraordinarily tidal, which is very predictable. And there's always a high tide from, let's say, the middle of the winter to the spring. And that high tide, if we match what it's been in the last 10 years, we would see crude oil prices go to about $101 or higher. I just don't think there's enough oomph to take it up to that high tide mark for the first half of the year. But the second half of the year, and particularly in August, when you have six or 700,000 barrels a day less Saudi crude and strong demand, that's a little worrisome. Tom, even before the developments of this weekend, the tightness that we see in the supply outlook has been worrisome, right? Do you think that's going to worsen in the coming months? And certainly there's a sense that the further escalation in this region doesn't help a market that's already being, uh, you know, these risks being exacerbated by multiple conflicts and, and elements at play here. I think it's a mixed view. I think that beyond the next few weeks, we're going to see supply loosen up. We're going to see refineries in the United States and Europe get back into gear. There are tremendous profits to be made by running those refineries. And we'll probably have a little bit of an interlude between the two acts of the 2024 play. Again, I'm more worried about late July, early August. The temperatures in the Atlantic Ocean are very warm and conducive to hurricanes and all of this worry about the Strait of Hormuz probably masks the fact that the U.S. Gulf of Mexico, where you could have hurricanes knock out a lot of production, exports about 12 million barrels a day of hydrocarbons during some, uh, some days. Uh, let's talk about the demand side a little bit. Is there really sort of greater optimism that's driving these dynamics coming from an expected meaningful recovery out of China? Uh, I think China has been a non-participant at most of this. And the worrisome thing for international demand is probably the fact that the U.S. dollar has performed very, very well. And companies with high growth, for example, India, uh, have much more expensive prices than they're used to. We're even seeing in the United States where it's an election year, clearly, and gasoline prices are a prime uh, issue. We're seeing some demand destruction there. It doesn't make sense in terms of the metrics of what people make and what they can afford, uh, but there's a reaction to high gas prices in the United States that's visceral. Tom, how robust do you expect the summer peak season to be? Because expectations have been set pretty high. Yeah, I'm, I'm worried about uh, not so much the beginning of the summer, but the end of the summer. Again, we haven't had a U.S. Uh, uh, impact from uh, hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico since 2021, the most serious one being in 2017. Everyone knows about Hurricane Katrina 18 years ago, but what they don't realize is that we've increased the amount of U.S. refining capacity from Corpus Christi to Pascagoula, Mississippi. So there are many, many more refineries as well as offshore oil that's in the target of potential tropical systems. Tom, we've, of course, spoken about geopolitical tensions in the Middle East, but we're also seeing the Ukraine targeting some of Russia's energy assets. Is that something that you're watching instead? Yeah, that is, you know, this is the year of drone attacks. Back in 2019, there was a drone attack in Saudi Arabia that we thought was going to knock out a lot of production. 
And drones pretty much disappeared as a factor in the oil markets until earlier this year. Russia has some additional refining capacity, and you know I don't think they're going to be a major player in gasoline markets, even though they may have to import it. The problem is we're looking at the lowest point of the year for demand for diesel and heating oil and those molecules, and that could be something that haunts the U.S. if Russia does lose 15 percent or more of its refining capacity due to drone strikes. So if you're not so much concerned perhaps about prices in the nearer term, but you're saying in the second half we could see them moving a little bit higher, what is your sort of target for, for end of year or your expectation? Uh, well, you know, by the end of the year, I think prices are going to be way down from where they uh, rise currently or where they rise in August. Uh, the last 100 days of the year, we'll see a lot more crude coming out, and there tends to be a low tide that uh, basically manifests itself from October into December and January. I'm really worried about the middle of the summer and the middle of the third quarter. And that's where we could have climate, which reared its head last year and impacted a lot of refining uh, capacity, could surge again this year. Tom Closer, Global Head of Energy Analysis at Oil Prices Information Services, there with us. Some of the other stories that we're following today. U.S. Speaker Mike Johnson says the House will vote this week to, uh, on aid for Israel and may add funds for Ukraine as part of that package. Johnson spoke to Fox News. Iran's attack on Israel gives Johnson added momentum for an alternative to a Senate-passed aid package that includes funds for Israel, Ukraine and the Indo-Pacific. The House Republicans and the Republican Party understand the necessity of standing with Israel. We are going to try again uh, this week, and uh, the, the details of that package are being put together right now. We're looking at the options and all these supplemental issues. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz has begun his second visit to China. He's expected to deliver the delicate message that Beijing has not acted on European warnings to end discriminatory business practices. Sources say Scholz wants to persuade Chinese President Xi Jinping that he needs to act soon to avoid EU tariffs meant to rebalance the trade relationship. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says nothing is off the table in response to China's manufacturing capacity. Speaking to CNN, Yellen suggests that includes the possibility of additional tariffs to stem a flood of goods into the U.S. market. Sources tell us the issue of China's overcapacity may be discussed at the IMF and World Bank meetings in Washington this week. Flags are at half-mast in Australia today, mourning six people killed on Saturday in a stabbing attack at a Sydney shopping mall. The offender has been identified as a 40-year-old man and authorities say there is no sign that it was an act of terrorism. He was shot dead by a lone female police officer who's been praised as a hero by Prime Minister Anthony Albanese. Eight survivors, including a nine-month-old child, remain in hospitals across Sydney. More ahead on Daybreak Australia. This is Bloomberg. Well, let's stay on the Middle East conflict now because U.S. officials and their allies are focusing efforts to ensure that any retaliation from Israel doesn't raise the stakes too high and trigger a full-blown regional war. For more, let's bring in Nick Wadhams, who leads our U.S. national security team. And Nick, I guess one of the most straightforward ways to stop Israel from raising the stakes too high is, is if Tel Aviv itself doesn't want to raise the stakes too high. Uh, given that it can sort of claim a victory of sorts in this weekend attack, given it, it prevented the la vast majority of missiles striking its ground. Do you think that they're going to want to have any sort of large-scale response? Well, that's the big question we are really all trying to answer right now. I mean, the signals from the U.S. side are very clear uh, that any response going forward should be diplomatic uh, and that uh, Israel basically proved that it has the advantage over Iran because it stopped, I think, 99 percent of the 300 drones and missiles that uh, were fired from Iran into Israel overnight Saturday night. But Israel uh, is uh, singing a very different tune. It says, listen, this was an unprecedented attack from Iranian territory, and uh, we are duty-bound to respond 
in some way this this can't be tolerated and we have the right to defend ourselves. So, uh, you know, in some ways, this is going to be a question of how much leverage the U.S. has over Israel. It's going to be how much uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu needs to respond to domestic concerns and also to uh, restore deterrence, as Israel Israeli officials say. Uh, so they're saying there will be a response. It's just a question of when and how severe. What is the capacity like for both Israel and the U.S., right, and I guess both militarily and politically, given the waning support we've seen for the operations in Gaza over the past few months? You know, it's a great question because there's there's been a lot of back and forth. Obviously, Israel was looking increasingly isolated over its conduct of the campaign in Gaza, and some analysts and officials have been telling us in the last 24 hours, you know, this is this is a moment where solidarity is back. Israel and the U.S. are closer together than they were uh, before. Uh, but the question is, you know, what does Israel do uh, in Gaza? It's not finished with the campaign there. And then again, how does it respond? So the military capacity is vast. I mean, Israel's army and air force uh, are, are extremely robust, so there's a lot they could do. The question is how far they want to push it uh, to, uh, it, to bring about a situation that may then push them into the isolation that they've been seeing for the last couple of months over the conduct of the campaign in Gaza. And Congress is set to vote on this long-delayed aid package this week as well. How does what happened this weekend and these sort of dynamics potentially you know, weigh into that? Is it expected to be, I guess, a renewed show of support from the Biden administration? Well, you know, the big question there is that there there is really no daylight between Republicans and Democrats on the question of passing aid for Israel. The, the much bigger question is uh, the aid for Ukraine, and that's where the disagreement is. Democrats say, listen, we are not going to split these two things up. If you want this $100 billion or so in aid, it's got to be both Israel and Ukraine, and then also elements for, for Taiwan. Uh, and Republicans say, hey, listen, let's just pass the Israel package and we can deal with Ukraine and the rest of it later. Uh, so it's not clear to me uh, when Mike Johnson, the speaker, says that they're going to do this this week, if he's talking about passing the whole thing or just trying again to ram through the Israel side, which Democrats had previously blocked. So I suspect what's happening there is they're still trying to work that out. Uh, that's going to be a jump ball uh, heading into this week. Why we saw that sort of support from the U.S. and its allies really waning came down to the, the escalating public criticism of Israel's deadly military operation in Gaza. Are we likely to see that focus, the military operation in Gaza, change at all? And, and as well, what does this mean for any sort of ceasefire negotiations, do you think? Well, uh, you know, again, a, a great question because so so much of that remains up in the air. Right right now, it appears as if the ceasefire talks have stalled again, in part because uh, Israel does not want to stop its campaign, but also Hamas has indicated that it simply does not have uh, the number of hostages anymore that uh, it could release to Israel. So. Uh, there, there's a lot of pressure for that. You had a group of seven statements today calling for a ceasefire and the release of the hostages. Uh, so it, Israel will come under renewed pressure there. But again, you have an issue of what happens to the rest of Gaza, to Rafah. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has staked so much of his uh, reputation in terms of protecting his right flank in Israel on proceeding with that campaign. And despite U.S. pressure, all indications suggest that he's determined to go ahead. Uh, despite what the international community says. So, again, something that we should have a little more clarity on in the next 48 hours. Nick Wadhams, who leads the U.S. national security team coverage there, and subscribers can read more on today's Big Take on the terminal. That's NI Big Take. That's your function. Or you can find that over at Bloomberg.com. More ahead here on Daybreak Australia. This is Bloomberg.
All right, taking a look at how gold is faring this morning, you're just a little bit higher. We are just uh, watching any sort of demand for haven assets, gold chief among them. And we've seen that huge run up really over the course of this year, a lot of buying coming through from central banks as well. Uh, but so far, gold is... is fairly steady, seven-tenths of a cent to the upside. What else we're tracking in the session is cryptocurrencies as well. So you've got uh, the <laughs> what's called often the digital gold, but we had actually seen some pretty inter interesting reaction coming through with Bitcoin prices at the weekend. We saw a pretty significant drop uh, after the Iran strike on Israel, but it has since recovered that and is now pushing past this point as well. It's a very interesting dynamic for Bitcoin this week because we're approaching the so-called Bitcoin halving. Uh, what this means is that miners receive less of a reward for mining or uh, tokens or validating the transactions. And so that in turn leads to less of a supply in the market. And it can put upward pr pressure on prices. Of course, what's different this time is that we saw Bitcoin reaching a fresh record high ahead of the halving. And that was after all of the optimism around spot Bitcoin ETF. So that is what we're tracking there. You are seeing this other tokens really moving to the upside as well. Lots of focus on Ether. And we've actually had local reporting for here in Hong Kong uh, that perhaps we could see spot Ether ETFs approved in the city as soon as this week. Uh, Solana again, uh, it's spiking here. But we are just, uh, of course, tracking that, tracking those moves in the crypto space. But Heidi, uh, lots of different gyrations this morning so far, including what we're seeing in the FX space. Yeah, you talked about the reaction in gold as a haven, cryptocurrency as uh, digital gold, if you will. And we're actually seeing uh, some sort of reaction when it comes to uh, some of the other haven aspects to FX. Right, Take a look at the yen, for example. Probably doesn't need an excuse to push any higher, given uh, we have seen sort of some of that daily intervention that's come through. But dollar yen still sitting sort of above that 153 level. Uh, another signal that investors have really kind of largely given up on the expectation that the yen is going to to kind of bust out as any kind of strong uh, haven role like out of the other currencies that are trading at the moment. So it does still seem like the US dollar is still the only game in town. The dollar has opened a little bit mixed this morning in Sydney trading amid these heightened Middle East tensions. Of course, traders are still kind of waiting to see if that unprecedented weekend strike by Iran on Israel will trigger rounds of retaliation. We are seeing some of the other haven behaviour, though, in the likes of the Swiss franc being quoted a little bit higher there as well. Uh, we've seen some soothing words through our Secretary of State Anthony Blinken. We know that the U.S. does not want sort of further escalation, and also uh, some words from the likes of Beijing as well, calling for restraint in this uh, situation. There is expectation that we could see 127, uh, 1 to 70 when it comes to the dollar index if we do see further geopolitical developments. Uh, and of course, we did see gold, uh, gold jumping after Iran's attack on Israel over the weekend. That drove broader demand for haven assets. Let's get some more when it comes to our energy and commodities editor, Andrew J James. And Andrew, you know, when it comes to a geopolitical reaction for gold, uh, that's textbook. What hasn't really been textbook is the broader moves that we've seen in this rally. I think it was about 1.2% at the open and obviously the, you know, the situation, the Iranian strike on Israel has, has added an extra bit of um, geopolitical risk but gold has been rallying very strongly since mid-February um, on a whole bunch of factors. Uh, the big one of course is the Fed gradually moving closer to its pivot. Um, We've also had very strong buying by central banks. We've had very strong buying by Chinese consumers who are worried about quite a few things happening in the Chinese economy, particularly the, the property downturn that's still not showing any, any signs of ending um, and st weakness in the stock market there. We have a range of sort of geopolitical risk factors, of course, the Middle East, but also the situation in Ukraine. We've got so many elections this year, particularly the big one in the US at the end of the year, which could be massively destabilizing for markets. So a, a whole host of uh, factors are pushing gold higher and the, the attacks on Israel over the weekend are just sort of adding a little bit of extra impetus to that. Is there... Any signal of, of how far this rally in gold could run? 
Um, well, we went above 2,400 an ounce on Friday for the first time ever. Um, Look, there are various uh, predictions around, but it, it's it's hard to say really. There are signs if you look at uh, technical indicators like relative strength index that um, gold is poised for a fall. Um, and in fact, after hitting the the record on Friday, it, it closed quite a bit lower. Um, but yeah, you'd have to say at, at this point the rally looks fairly stretched, but. Um, yeah, it could move higher. It's unlikely to go a lot higher, but it's it's really hard to predict. All right, that was our Energy and Commodities Editor, Andrew James. Thanks so much for your time this morning. And let's uh, take a quick look at how US futures are uh, trading so far in the early moments. We have seen them moving actually just a little bit higher uh, so far. Pretty interesting to end the week as well because we started off US bank earnings and uh, they pretty much disappointed. So uh, given we've got that sort of reaction so far, it tells us that perhaps these concerns around Middle East tensions are, are sort of subdued for now. Uh, but that's the state of play that we see there for for futures. And as we said, more of our coverage coming up in the next hour. We're going to be looking further at what's happened in the Middle East. We'll speak with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace joining us shortly. Plus, we hear from Nomura about the weak Japanese yen. Uh, questions, of course, is whether the yen is really even still acting as sort of a safe haven currency. You've got a lot of traders as well uh, still tracking or watching for intervention. But the market opens uh, ahead. We will be tracking those when they come online in another hour's time from now. Sydney, Seoul and Tokyo. This is Bloomberg. Welcome to Debrick Australia. I'm Hardy Stradwatts in Sydney. We're counting down to Asia's major market opens. I'm Annabelle Droolers in Hong Kong. The top stories this hour. A muted early response to Iran's attack on Israel as markets begin to trade or open in Asia. Traders seemingly ready to look past the geopolitics to data and earnings that are due this week. The UN chief is telling an emergency Security Council meeting that it's time to step back from the brink of a full-scale Middle East war while Israel and the US consider their next steps. And Tehran saying the attacks mark a new equation, signalling a bigger response to any further Israeli strikes. Take a look at how we're setting up as we head into uh, Monday morning with Asian markets and traders uh, waking and really confronted with uh, this risk of a further escalation in the Middle East. We are seeing traders cautious, pretty cautiously trading into uh, this future session. You're seeing Sydney stocks down by about six tenths of a percent in trading in futures. We've got New Zealand down by about one percent. We do have CPI, uh, that print coming through from New Zealand, as well as some pretty bad uh, services number. Uh, numbers out due today as well. So uh, quite a bit of concern over how much that will exacerbate what we already see as recessionary conditions for the Kiwi economy. Chicago and Nikkei futures are looking positive at this point, a tenth of 1%. We have the yen pretty stubbornly holding beyond that 153 level, really kind of uh, uh, casting a shadow over its, uh, even its ability to be able to function as a haven at a time when we're seeing other haven assets, the likes of gold, the likes of the Swiss franc and even the dollar moving higher but not so much for the yen, still at 153. Uh, and China futures down by just about half a percent, Bell. Yeah, again, as you say, not seeing too much of a reaction so far. And this is actually the state of play that we've got with US futures actually just pushing a little bit higher. We had uh, some pretty disappointing bank earnings on Friday, but uh, that isn't casting too much of a shadow just yet, although we did see some weaker trade into the end of last week. Uh, bond futures as well there, just uh, again, fairly steady at this point in time, as is Brent crude, even though you're holding above that 
$90 a barrel mark. So certainly perhaps it is just that wait and see mode, whether we see any further ratcheting up of those tensions. Well, we are hearing that diplomatic response now. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken saying Washington does not want escalation in the Middle East while continuing to support Israel's right to defense. Bloomberg Balance of Power anchor Joe Matthew joins us now from Washington. Joe, we're also getting, uh, of course, some commentary when it comes to the Chinese ambassador to the U.N. Uh, again, calling for restraint and voicing China's concerns over potential escalation. On the one hand, it feels like the developments over the weekend bring us closer than ever to the brink of all-out war in the Middle East. On the other hand, the sort of calibration that we saw in how this was orchestrated and carried out suggests that perhaps there's room for this to be the end of it. Well, look, that's true. It, this requires perspective from a couple of different angles here. Uh, you're right. This was an unprecedented attack to think that this actually happened, Iran attacking Israel on its own soil. But unprecedented as well was the response, the incredible way Israel managed to defend itself with the help of the U.S., the U.K., and France to actually have the help of an alliance in this case and do so successfully. No UAVs managed to infiltrate Israel. That is an incredible headline. Of 30 Iranian cruise missiles that were launched, not one entered Israeli airspace. So the question is, does that represent the response, essentially? Do you hit back at an attacker if they cannot lay a glove on you? If you look at the statement from the White House that followed this attack, and look toward the bottom, there's one line that sticks out. The president says, I will convene my fellow G7 leaders to coordinate a united diplomatic response. That is not a military response, and that is not a unilateral response. The president the administration in this case trying to widen this to our allies beyond a standoff in the Middle East to transcend this dispute in the hopes of making this a calmer place. This administration is in a real pickle right now and it has very few options as it waits to see exactly what Israel will do. And, and when it does come to exactly what Israel does, Given perhaps that this assault is more demonstrated or designed to, to show resolve than rather than overcoming Israel's defences, perhaps Israel could look to limit their response. But what exactly mm -hmm. does a, a, a limited response look like, do you think? Well, it's a great question because I don't think they saw the response from Iran as being proportional to its attack on an Iranian diplomatic facility in Syria. That's what, of course, prompted uh, these missiles and rockets uh, last night. I can tell you that Joe Biden did have a meeting today on the phone with the leaders on Capitol Hill, and we just learned this from the White House. That's Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, the Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, along with the Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, and House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries. Mike Johnson has some very difficult decisions to make this week as they seek funding for Israel. And if Israel does decide to respond here, and this does appear to be escalatory, you're going to see more pushback from progressive Democrats. If Israeli funding is tied with Ukrainian funding, that will jeopardize both. So there's an enormous amount on the line tonight for this White House, and that's why you're seeing direct engagement with Israel. All right, that was Bloomberg Balance of Power anchor Joe Matthew there. And uh, let's bring in Aaron David Miller. He's senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He previously served as a U.S. State Department negotiator on Middle Eastern issues. So, uh, Aaron, thanks so much for joining us this evening. And uh, as we can see, Israel scored perhaps a, a sort of tactical security and a political success here. And as I know that you, you write on Twitter, the question is, how can it turn that into a strategic opportunity without courting a regional war? So give us more insights into that. Um, here's what we know. The War Cabinet met. Thanks for having me. Uh, the War Cabinet with three key decision makers, the Prime Minister, the Minister of Defense, uh, <clears throat> and the former Minister of Defense, Benny Gantz, um, Netanyahu's putative successor if elections were held today. Uh, and two uh, non-voting members. Uh, there appears to be consensus on the part of the key three key decision makers that Israel needs to respond. But there is a divergence of opinion about the timing of that response uh, and the scale of that response. 
Um, and, and, and I should say, just for, for context and perspective here, this is a very long movie. Even if this phase, which is unprecedented, both in, in terms of what the Iranians did, the first state to strike Israel directly in 33 years since Saddam Hussein launched 43 scuds in uh, 1991, um, even if this is managed successfully, the sources of tensions between Israel and Iran, the competition, the rivalry, the Israeli-Lebanese front, which is critically important, Hezbollah can do far more damage, far more damage to the state of Israel right now than Iran. It takes hours for those drones, even the cruise missiles, which are faster, uh, to travel the thousand miles. Hezbollah is kilometers away. They have a inventory of high trajectory weapons of varying uh, ranges, lethalities, and precision, capable of launching four to 5,000 rockets a day. Um, that's going to be uh, a source of tension. It will. It is not going to be resolved, even if we get through this. Pro-Iranian militias in Iraq and Syria continue sporadically to attack American assets, American forces uh, in Iraq, Syria, and as we saw in Jordan. And then you have, of course, the chokehold that the Houthis, a small Zaidi Shia sect that controls the most populous part of Yemen, able to um, impose serious constraints on global shipping, forcing uh, traffic around the Cape of Good Hope, adding another 3,500 miles to the supply chain. So even if we manage this, and I suspect an Israeli response is not imminent, um, this is going to be hanging over, hanging over the collective heads of the international community and the region for a very long time to come. Given that the attack by Iran was so calibrated, do you think uh, they can still claim this to be a sort of success of sorts for Tehran? Well, internally, they are already drumming up the notion that they uh, uh, have struck the, the quote-unquote Zionist entity. You see demonstrations in Te Tehran. These are all orchestrated and calibrated. The reality is that the Iranians suffered, I think, a strategic or at least a tactical defeat. 99% of these missiles, pilotless drones, ballistic and cruise missiles, uh, most, the vast majority never even reached um, Israeli territory. Uh, but again, Iran has Hezbollah, and Iran also is a nuclear weapons threshold state. It has all of the elements required to weaponize should it decide to do so. So I guess I, I, I'd want to say my judgment on this, um, we're going to get through this without what I would describe to you as a major regional war, something the Middle East has never seen before, something that would create spiking oil prices, plunging financial markets, and a degree of instability across the region um, that this region has never experienced. We're going to get through this. But the problem, the strategic problem that the U.S. has with Iran, that the international community has with Iran, and clearly the strategic problem Israel has with Iran, um, is not going to be resolved. We're managing. Uh, and maybe if we're lucky and smart, we'll get through this latest phase uh, without a serious regional escalation. But the trend lines on this one do not look good at all. Could we get out of this with something better? Because I know you've written about, you know, the the unpredictable predictability of what happens in this region, right? And how you often have periods of intense crisis and often horrific situations, like what happened on October seventh, uh, but then followed by positive outcomes. Are you slightly optimistic that this could be one of the turning points? You know, it's it's not pessimism or optimism. It's just uh, 27 years of working on these issues. Uh, American war-making, American peacemaking in the Middle East. More often than not, American ideas uh, get swallowed up by a region uh, in which great powers wrongly believe they can impose their will, their aspirations, their schemes, their dreams on smaller ones. Occasionally, with the right leadership, Anwar Sadat, Menachem Begin, and Jimmy Carter, Camp David Accords, an effort, at least on the Israeli-Palestinian track, with Rabin and Arafat, an Israeli-Jordanian peace treaty, and now, perhaps, opportunities between Israel on one hand and uh, key Arab states on the other. But the reality is, um, ladies, you need leadership 
you need leaders on the Israeli and Palestinian side and in Washington uh, that are not prisoners of their ideologies or their politics. You need a Mandela a cleric, a Sadat a Beg, and a King Hussein a Rabin to take the kinds of decisions which are existential, not just politically, but literally ask Sadat and Isaac Rabin, who paid for their lives with their lives for their peacemaking efforts. So uh, no, I I I retain a, a fair measure of hope, but but right now what is required to turn October 7, the terror surge, and what the Israelis have done in Gaza over the past six months into anything more positive really does require leaders who can rise above their partisan politics and risk. And in this in this region, uh, that, that risk can often prove uh, to be fatal. We don't have that right now. Should Joe Biden get a second term, I voted and worked for Republicans and Democrats. You can take this as a partisan comment or not. Should Joe Biden get a second term? Should there be a leadership change in Israel with a government that's prepared to be pragmatic and flexible, um, not what we see now, which is the most extremist right-wing government in the history of the state, and significant leadership on the Palestinian side and from the Arab states? I think you actually could. There is an opening here. But again, um, Nobody ever lost money betting against Arab-Israeli peace. I'd say that based on my own experiences. That's a lot, you know, and you said it out there, that's a lot of ducks that need to be in a row, right? And a lot of them are not sort of anywhere close to uh, close to formation. But I, I, I do think, you know, is it a worthy question to talk about capacity, right? Both political, uh, economic, and, and just the willingness for the US, for, for Biden during an election year, for Israel when it's already got operations in Gaza, the level of support that we see waning for those operations, uh, for Iran's friends like China and Russia, each with their own problems. Do you see that coming together and impacting the likelihood of sort of major developments going forward? No, I, I really don't. I mean, I think you can get British, American, and uh, and French consensus. But the Russians and the Chinese, uh, a senior partner in China, a junior partner in Russia, really are determined, it seems to me, uh, to make inroads in the global south, to oppose American influence, Western influence, uh, wherever they find it uh, inimical to Chinese and Russian interests. Uh, the Russian-Iran relationship is, is a strategic one. Uh, China, obviously, is not interested in regional stability. After all, it's the U.S. Navy, frankly, that is protecting. Talk about ironies. It's the U.S. Navy that is protecting the exports of Saudi Arabian oil to China. So um, it, it just doesn't seem to me that the vaunted international community has the will, the bandwidth, or the cohesion uh, to complement, to support regional parties who right now, frankly, aren't interested. Uh, Israel is being led by a man, Benjamin Netanyahu, who's on trial for bribery, fraud, and breach of trust in a Jerusalem district court, three years running. He has to maintain power at all costs. If he doesn't, he's faced probably with a conviction or a plea agreement that's going to drive him out of politics. Mahfoud Abbas is 89 years old. He's in the 19th year, 19th year of a four-year term. He has no credibility in the West Bank and less credibility in Gaza. So again, no matter what the Americans want, and I think the administration's aspirations um, are, are well-intentioned, you can't pull the wagon without the horses. And right now, you have two leaders in Israel and the putative state of Palestine that are more interested in keeping their seats than they are risking anything um, with respect to taking advantage of whatever openings exist. So, again, um, I think we have to be very realistic. It's going to take time, and as I mentioned, uh, probably once too often, leadership. Aaron David Miller, always great to have you with us, Senior Fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Coming up next, why Oxford Economics thinks China's growth rate increased in the first quarter but could come at a cost for second quarter data. This is Bloomberg.
Well, taking a look at the week ahead now, and China's economy will be front and center with a rate decision later Monday and the deluge of economic data releases on Tuesday. Most economists expect the PBOC to hold off on a, on a rate cut to avoid further undermining the yuan. Consensus also sees weaker economic readings for China, with first quarter growth moderating to below 5%. Meanwhile, Japan's core inflation may cool in March, but still remain well above the BOJ's 2% target. And in the U.S., March retail sales are expected to show a slowdown as consumers struggle with higher prices. And that is your week ahead. And Belle, it is a big week, of course, going into that China data and the PBOC decision as well on rates. Our next guest thinks that China's growth rate increased in, at least when it comes to a sequential basis in the first quarter. Joining us now is Louise Liu, who's a lead economist at Oxford Economics. But Louise, the caveat, of course, is uh, there's some front road loading and destocking going on that's been moved forward, right? So will that come at the expense of second quarter numbers? Yes, absolutely. So you... You recall we did have very strong manufacturing data, and that's what everybody is really excited about. We also had pretty strong export data, at least for January and February. March was a bit disappointing, which kind of suggests to us that the momentum on the external front may be fading, which also means that manufacturing onshore might not actually find a buyer in Q2. Um, so there is some necessary destocking process that we think will happen in Q2 that will drag growth down relative to Q1. How do you feel about the Chinese consumer and the household in particular? There were some concerns that it sort of really stuck on this downward sentiment spiral. Do you see signs of improvement mm. on that? I think so far Q1 has been relatively resilient compared to what we were expecting. Um, of course, we, we did have a pretty, pretty late Lunar New Year that distorts the data a little bit um, if you look at it from a month-on-month -month basis. But in general, I think we, we went into um, 2024 thinking that perhaps you know, much of that post-COVID recovery has basically run its course, and it really hasn't. Um, so that suggests to us that, you know, the idea that they are quite entrenched in this deflationary mindset may not be as severe as we think. Now, the problem is that because of deflationary uh, impulses, um, households do still face quite high interest rates, real interest rates. So that would also peg um, bank expenditure a little bit, which is where we think um, that is the area that the government, if they could, would be perhaps most primed to support. I'm curious uh, what your views are with the sort of overcapacity problems that have been discussed in China's economy, because right now we know, of course, uh, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, he's got a very delicate message he's bringing to Beijing this week that they haven't acted enough on, on warnings from Europe to end their discriminatory practices in business. Do you see... Ooh that issue of, of a protectionist backlash hitting China's economy? Absolutely. So I think that is probably, that is probably more of a near-term cyclical risk to the economy, we think. Um, and I say near-term because if you look at the long-term fundamentals, there's still a lot of demand for some of these products that Chinese, the Chinese is producing, especially when it comes to some of these decarbonization green um, products like EVs or, or solar panels. Um, the problem is that if you look at the the messaging between, um, you, you, sp you spoke about the German Chancellor, but if you look at the messaging between Secretary uh, Yellen as well as uh, some of the top Beijing officials um, two weeks ago, it does seem like there is not really much appetite within Chinese officials to do much about um, the perceived overcapacity uh, problem. We do, some of, we do see some evidence of overcapacity in the macro data, so it is translating through, if you look at the, the supply side, the demand side, and that discrepancy across some of these products. But it does seem like so far we won't be expecting any uh, pullback from the Chinese officials if, if that's what people are really anticipating. And it's not just, of course, that focus on China's economy this week. We've got trade numbers due out from other countries as well. What's the general trend that you're seeing here after the Lunar New Year break? Yeah, we're seeing a bit of moderation after the Lunar New Year break, which is a bit disappointing because we were expecting... Um, really the global economy, global demand to, to kind of do a bit of a steady pickup from here on. But I think across Asian exporters, um, as some of them will publish data later this week, uh, we would see that that recovery is pretty much a bit of a bathtub shape. So, you know, you, you have a very slow um, L-shaped type of recovery, which really isn't, isn't particularly um, spectacular. Um, so that kind of suggests to us that, you know, at, at least across Asia, 
um, we are expecting that you would need to have more domestic demand support to offset some of these external weaknesses. All right, that was Louise Liu there, lead economist at Oxford Economics, and we'll have more ahead. This is Bloomberg. All right, you're taking a look at a live shot of the Tel Aviv skyline there this evening after Israel and its allies mostly foiled an unprecedented Iranian drone and missile attack on the Jewish state. No fatalities reported and also its army base was lightly damaged. But it is the early part of, of the morning here and you can see uh, we are getting a bit more context on that attack coming through from the United States Central Command. So one of the units of the Department of Defense uh, area of responsibility includes the Middle East, but they're saying that they intercepted or destroyed at least six missiles that were intended to strike Israel. As well, CENTCOM is saying that it is postured to support Israel's defense against these dangerous actions by Iran. So some more of a readout again on that weekend attack. From our point of view, this operation is over and there's no intention to continue the operation. But if the Zionist regime takes any action against the Islamic Republic, whether on our soil or in places belonging to us in Syria or elsewhere, our next operation will be much larger. That was the chief of staff of Iran's armed forces speaking on state TV on Sunday. And China, meanwhile, has voiced its deep concern over the escalation of violence in the Middle East, calling on all parties to show maximum calm and restraint. Our chief North Asia correspondent Stephen Engel is here in Hong Kong. And uh, Steve, yeah, so, so all parties voicing constraint here or restraint. What else are we hearing exactly? Yeah, we might get more today uh, on a Monday in Beijing from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but we did get a statement uh, from China's ambassador to the UN essentially saying exactly what you just said, uh, voicing their deep concern about the escalation and the retaliatory strike by Iran to Israel. And again, on Friday, we had also heard that Wang Yi and Antony Blinken had discussed this as well. Now, both sides, if you want to call the different sides, the United States and China, as, as sort of proxies to what's happening, obviously, in the Middle East. And, of course, because of China's deep ties with Tehran, uh, both sides between China and the United States have called on the others to play constructive roles in trying to broker, uh, you know, or de-escalate the tension in the Middle East, obviously. China maintains those close ties with Iran. Uh, about 90 percent of Iran's oil exports go to China. Mm. And again, of course, last year we saw Beijing play a critical role in brokering, you know, detente between Tehran and Saudi Arabia. So they're obviously, they have some influence. And they are watching the developments over the weekend with, uh, and, you know, trepidation, obviously. Uh, and again, they have uh, reiterated that call for a ceasefire in the Gaza. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz is uh, now in China. He's got a delicate mission of another sort. So how does he deliver this message to try and avert an EU-China trade war, given we know the long relationship between China and Germany? Yeah, that's right. I mean, obviously, uh, the German, uh, you know, the number one trade partner of Germany is China in last year. So he has to walk a tightrope. Obviously, he wants to be able to keep that uh, trade relationship going, but at the same time, not undermine what has been a growing call from EU leaders uh, uh, about, you know, calling on China to stop its discriminatory trade practices and offering subsidies in key critical sectors, including uh, new energy vehicles, uh, EVs. About a third of China's EV exports go to the EU. And this is a, a sensitive time for Olaf Scholz. So he was in Chongqing yesterday. He flies to Shanghai today. And then he'll have those key meetings uh, tomorrow, Tuesday, in Beijing. And again, like I said, he's going to have to walk a tightrope not to undermine Europe's increasingly vocal stance on uh, you know, commerce between the EU and China. So it actually is a very key meeting and trip, a four-day visit for Olaf Scholz to China. 
our chief North Asia correspondent Stephen Engel there. Uh, and take a look at how we're trading. Of course, the standout when it comes to broader commodities has been this further leg up that we've seen in gold. And even before the uh, geopolitical developments over the weekend, we have seen this somewhat uh, perplexing rally that we've seen in this gold rush, right? But uh, we are seeing a little bit more sort of uh, further movement, six tenths of one percent higher, as we see uh, really after that Iran strike against Israel stoking more haven demand, mostly expressed through gold and the likes of the Swiss franc as well. Not so much through uh, yen, for example, this morning. Crude is holding pretty steady. We've seen pretty muted trading uh, on the energy front in response to the geopolitical escalations. And in fact, New York crude is falling about a tenth of one percent there. Iron ore is also one to watch. Pretty flat at the moment. But of course, it is a big uh, week when it comes to China data. Expectations that the first quarter numbers will be quite favourable, uh, potentially at the expense of second quarter numbers looking a little bit weaker. But iron ore uh, really ahead of that 10 percent weekly surge last week on the back of the improving outlook for the Chinese economy. But let's get more on this gold rally. Our Asia commodities reporter Sibylla Gross joins us in Melbourne. And Sibylla, you know, the, the, the haven reaction is pretty textbook. What we've seen as the drivers for the rally until this weekend, perhaps a little bit more confusing. Yeah, definitely, Heidi. I think everyone's scratching their head over gold at the moment because really gold is flying in the face of what we know of um, when it, it should perform well, really, with expectations for rate cuts. And they've just been pushed back um, after a series of really strong economic data out of the US. Um, look, one factor we really can't ignore in the gold story at the moment is China. Um, we've seen just persistently strong demand uh, from both you know, local investors and also the central bank buying up huge volumes of gold. Um, and it's, it's kind of a weird uh, reversal in the trend, so to speak, because typically China has been uh, um, a sector where when prices drop, that's when demand rises. But if anything, prices are, you know, the, the Shanghai premiums trading at elevated levels and we're not seeing any drop off in demand there. And we know China is the biggest consumer of gold, so that really can't be ignored um, in the whole gold mystery rally uh, story at the moment. <laughs> And, and you can really see that enthusiasm for, for Chinese gold demand in particular when you take a look at some of their gold ETFs and they're trading at a big premium to net asset values. So uh, are we likely to see a further run up from this point in time? Uh, when, when it comes to China, it's hard. I mean, who knows what will happen, but it's hard to see um, or imagine a situation where, given the, um, the state of the property sector and the equity sector uh, in that market, it's hard to see. Imagine a situation where investors are going to turn off gold suddenly. Um, more broadly, what that means for the spot price, it's hard to say. We have seen in recent weeks a number of banks upgrade their uh, price forecasts for gold this year. So seeing uh, $2,500 an ounce being thrown ar around quite a bit. Um, whether that will happen in the near term or a little bit further down the track, it's hard to say. Our Asia Commodities reporter Sevilla Gross there in Melbourne as we continue to watch uh, really just another impetus when it comes to the gains in gold with the geopolitical uh, jitters over the weekend. Take a look at how we're setting up when it comes to the start of uh, cash trading as we get uh, just about half an hour or so, 20 minutes away from the start of that staggered to open to the session here in Sydney. We're seeing ASX futures looking a little bit softer, six tenths of a percent. Their traders really moving pretty cautiously uh, in the wake of those attacks on Israel by or from Iranian soil that we saw over the weekend, pretty unprecedented. And really, we are still seeing the market kind of impact of that play through. New Zealand, where trading is already underway, we're seeing quite a bit of downside there. Some domestic factors there. Uh, New Zealand services sector that posted the biggest contraction in two years. And we're also expecting key CPI numbers this week as well to kind of potentially uh, paint a, a, a broader picture around what those recessionary conditions look like for the Kiwi economy. Singapore Nikkei futures a little bit to the downside there. And we see the yen holding pretty firmly uh, through that 153 level, despite, of course, haven demand for other classic haven assets. US futures are seeing a little bit of upside there for tenths of a percent uh, as, of course, we head into a big week for earnings as well.
in particular when it comes to the big banks, Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, Morgan Stanley, all due to report in this coming week. And that's after net interest income missed analyst estimates for peers, including JP Morgan and Wells Fargo, although Citi's profit actually was better than expectations. Let's bring our finance editor, Adam Hay. So uh, JP Morgan, what does it kind of set expectations for for the rest of the year then? I think in many ways, Heidi, it's really just it was an excuse for investors to just take a little bit of, of money off the table. Those softness around the net interest income uh, numbers had been, you know, the expectations were certainly that things were going to have to soften somewhat. I think maybe that was a little bit more than, than expectations. You, you saw that in the in the share price decline, six and a half percent or so. Uh, but it doesn't mean that your expectations for the rest of the year com completely drop off. I mean, if you think about the way that Diamond's been uh, characterizing the way that the US economy is developing at the moment. Um, in many ways, this is kind of fitting with, with the way that he sees uh, things progressing. And I think he's well aware of uh, positioning the bank for, for a range of outcomes. And one of those key outcomes, of course, is that rates stay higher um, for a little bit longer than you might have thought um, six months ago. So in many ways, the bank is already positioned for that. I think over at Citigroup, maybe slightly different story. And of course, Jane Fraser's big global restructuring still uh, playing through. Um, they're talking about you know seven odd thousand jobs having already been uh, removed, and, and some of that still has to still has to play out. So there are kind of other catalysts, I think, for for City that are still worth worth watching. This week, of course, the big ones are uh, Goldman and, and Bank of America, and that that kind of whether we see more of this pressure on net interest income, whether we see more commentary, especially um, from the CEOs around how they see the economy and whether or not um, you know some of the repricing from markets and the way that they see the Fed, whether that's in any way kind of affecting just the way that they position things on the margin at the bank. But I think all the US banks are pretty well structured now for, you know, a, a, a reasonably kind of benign economic environment. And, and in many ways, investors are, are still pricing that kind of um, sector of the market reasonably highly. So you'd expect bank stocks to still do reasonably well in this environment. Yeah, and as you say, given that we've got sort of that re-evaluation going on and these changing expectations once again around the Fed, so you, you do think that bank stocks remain favourable then? Well, I mean, think about how quickly the market has, has changed its opinion and had to reassess uh, in the last few months, Annabelle. As, as you know well, you know, many forecasts have, have been thrown out the window uh, from month to month. So um, positioning your bank, if you're a CEO running these companies, you still have to be uh, cognizant of the fact that the economy could, could deteriorate a little bit further. But you also have to uh, realize that if inflation stays reasonably, um, uh, you know, controlled, and, and, and growth, as it seems to be picking up again, uh, then you have an environment which, which suits you reasonably well, especially when a lot of these banks have already gone through the restructuring and the, and the kind of the job reductions in headcount cost control and um, that sets them up pretty well for this stage in the cycle. So I think the key is to keep an eye on that net interest income number uh, from those other banks this week. But just watch that commentary on the economy from the CEOs as they come out this week. For sure. I find I said it out and hang there ahead of those big uh, US bank earnings that continue this week. Coming up next, Nomura sharing their outlook on the yen as traders weigh fresh geopolitical risks that's not passing through when it comes to a stronger yen, at least this morning, and also looking at the increased risk of intervention. This is Bloomberg. It is time now for Japan Ahead and Japan's core machine orders are due this hour. We'll be watching also Nippon Steel shares, US Steel shareholders voting in favour of the $14 billion takeover offer and the fate of that deal now resting with the US regulators and uh, political impetus really. Honda also planning to start manufacturing in its first US made fully electric vehicle at its plant in Ohio next year, Bell. Yeah, and Heidi, of course, we're keeping a track on how 
Japanese assets are likely to fare at the start. You're actually seeing Nikkei Futures, that contract in Singapore, just coming online to the downside here, so off 1.4%. The question, of course, how much is that a reaction to tensions in the Middle East, this, this strike by Iran on Israel over the weekend, uh, versus as well other factors that are playing into it, like uh, weaker than expected bank earnings coming through from the US, and then performance of the S&P 500 into the end of last Friday. But uh, keeping a close watch on what happens in currency markets in turn, and you're seeing the dollar yen here holding very steady at the 153 mark. That's despite some pickup or some move that we're seeing into other assets that are typically seen as safe havens like gold, a firmer dollar coming through. And actually, let's just take a look at, at uh, the, the moves we've seen longer term of the Japanese yen this year, because when you compare it again to more of those safe haven plays, uh, the dollar yen that's weaker over the course of this year. Swiss franc yen, though, is a little bit different here. Year on year, it, it's a little changed. You did see it a little bit stronger, the yen against the Swiss, fra Swiss franc after the surprise cut by the SMB, the Swiss Central Bank. But uh, certainly let's get more on the role of Japan's currency as a safe haven, whether that's still in play, and bring in Nomura's head of Japan FX strategy, Yujiro Goto. And Yujiro, I'm curious for your views. Do you still see the yen acting as a safe haven asset in these sorts of environments? Hi. Uh, yes, uh, I think uh, Japanese yen can uh, still work as a safe haven currency uh, at the moment, especially because uh, CFTC data suggests that there is uh, quite uh, big uh, and short positions uh, held by both the leverage fund and asset managers. So uh, any negative surprise uh, can encourage a position unwinding of an uh, end short position in the market. But uh, uh, in terms of uh, tensions in the Middle East, uh, we expect the uh, uh, impact on the yen will be uh, actually mixed uh, because a uh, higher oil price uh, will be actually uh, quite negative for Japanese uh, trade balance and uh, can work against the Japanese yen. And also, uh, if the oil price increase further, the market uh, could expect the Fed or other foreign central banks to be more hawkish, high for longer expectation, can support uh, dollar yen or other yen crosses as well. So I think a position unwinding can can be uh, supportive for Japanese yen in terms of uh, uh, any negative surprise, but the uh, uh, oil price movement is uh, acting uh, quite uh, uh, negatively for Japanese yen. So uh, net net, uh, I think uh, uh, this uh, tensions in the Middle East will have uh, quite a neutral uh, impact at the moment, and uh, we should uh, monitor further uh, volatility in the market uh, will increase further from here because. Volatility is a key driver for uh, any and carry trade type uh, trade positions. And if we have a spike in the volatility, the position unwinding can be more aggressive. So uh, I think volatility is quite important this week. Yeah, but as you say, it's that question of what we see in terms of oil prices, whether we do reach, say, $100 a barrel, that's been mooted by some in the market, what that means for the Fed, higher Treasury yields in turn. How weak can the yen get from here, given you've also got the, the, the at least verbal intervention we've seen so far? Yeah, so in terms of the verbal intervention, I think uh, comments from the uh, Japanese officials last week was uh, actually not as strong as uh, I, uh, we expected uh, when uh, uh, that I am broke uh, 152, 153. So uh, it, there is a, a higher chance for the uh, Japanese authorities to wait uh, and, uh, before uh, that I am uh, trades uh, even higher toward 154 or 155. But uh, I think uh, situation is a little bit different in Japan from uh, a year ago uh, because Japan's inflation is now uh, really much stronger than uh, 12, 24 months ago. And especially uh, what's important is Japan's inflation now is more driven by domestic factors like uh, service inflation and wage inflation. And in this regard, two years ago, uh, when oil price was uh, uh, trading uh, higher, I think a uh, uh, higher import price and, uh, uh, and weakness were at least somewhat positive for uh, Bank of Japan because uh, that helped uh, inflation to accelerate. But now, uh, probably the Bank of Japan doesn't need to have a higher import price inflation or uh, any weakness to achieve 2% inflation. And uh, a higher import price inflation would be actually negative for Japanese economy because 
uh, real income uh, may start uh, decline again, even after a very encouraging wage negotiation. So in this regard, uh, reaction function of Japanese authorities against the Japanese yen weakness is probably uh, quite different uh, now. So not uh, imminent, but uh, uh, we can expect the uh, Bank of Japan can react to uh, an weakness by hiking uh, its policy rates a little bit earlier than market expect if N keeps weakening. So in this regard, I uh, still think that uh, in the medium, uh, in the, into the second half of the year, that N is more likely to trade uh, toward uh, 145 or even below. Uh, so the top side of the dollar N will be uh, likely limited around 155. On, on the issue of intervention, as you mentioned, the jaw burning that we've heard has at most kind of kept level steady over the past few sessions. Uh, how useful and impactful is intervention, particularly when you see the effect fade pretty quickly? Yeah, so I have to say FX intervention cannot change the uh, trend of the currency market. So uh, any uh, M buying intervention will be uh, kind of uh, will have temporary uh, impact. Uh, but uh, what's important is, again, the Bank of Japan may start uh, hiking uh, its policy rate more aggressively into the second half of the year. And uh, also, the uh, Fed uh, is more likely to start cutting policy rates in July uh, this year. So uh, fundamental is more uh, supportive for uh, M uh, going forward, probably uh, over the summer this year. So uh, next month or so, uh, for the next uh, few months, uh, still uh, Minister of Finance may need to uh, step in the market to uh, avoid further M weakness. But uh, I think uh, Fundamental story will be uh, more uh, supportive for Japanese yen from uh, June or July uh, this year. So uh, I think uh, a combination of the yen uh, buying intervention and more hawkish POJ will be a good uh, supportive factor uh, for a Japanese yen in the medium term. Uh, Yujiro, just to, you can hold for one moment because we do want to just make mention some numbers that have just dropped here. This is the Japan machine orders, core machine orders coming out for February. And actually, uh, the numbers are coming through a lot better than what had been expected by economists. So month on month, you're actually seeing them rise 7.7%. The estimate had been for 0.8%. And then also uh, core machine orders on the year, they're actually looking to have contracted, but not as much as had been expected, uh, down 1.8%. And then the survey had been for a 6% contraction instead. So uh, it is looking, Heidi, a lot better than, than, than what economists have been expecting. Again, core machine orders, sort of a, a broader sentiment check on the health of Japan's economy. Uh, and uh, Yujiro, just wanted to get your reaction to that. And I guess, you know, just one more puzzle piece in terms of where we see the momentum for the Bank of Japan, right? When you hear from policymakers, when you hear from the governor, it does feel like they're not in a huge hurry and therefore there's no immediate impetus uh, to, to help the yen strengthen. Yeah, uh, I think uh, uh, that data uh, just now uh, suggests that uh, economic momentum in Japan is uh, clearly recovering and the wage negotiation outcome is also quite uh, strong. So again, I have to say uh, domestic inflation pressure is now much stronger than uh, uh, one or uh, two years ago. And uh, therefore, uh, Bank of Japan is still uh, more likely to be uh, gradually uh, hawkish uh, into the second half of the year. And at the earliest, uh, July could be the timing for the BOJ to hike again. And also, uh, at the next uh, April BOJ meeting, uh, Bank of Japan is going to release its uh, uh, inflation forecast and uh, uh, upgrade in the inflation forecast is quite uh, likely. And uh, after uh, that inflation forecast upgrade, uh, potentially uh, Bank of Japan can hike uh, its policy rate anytime. So uh, June is probably a bit uh, too early, but still uh, June uh, meeting can be a live meeting uh, with a decent chance of the BOJ's uh, rate hike. So I think uh, uh, that will uh, mm -hmm. still uh, support uh, Japanese yen uh, from the monetary policy standpoint. All right. Yujiro, thanks so much for your time this morning. That was Nomura's head of Japan FX strategy. Yujiro go to in Tokyo. There we'll have more ahead. And this is Bloomberg.